enjoying the Fretboard Journal podcast? If so, please take 20 seconds out of your time to go over to iTunes and leave us a review. It helps us out with our search rankings, which means other like-minded guitar people like yourself can find the show easier, and that, in turn, helps us grow. Welcome to the Fretboard Journal podcast. I am your host, Jason Verlindi. I'm the publisher of the Fretboard Journal print magazine, and as always, that is John Rauhaus playing in the background. Today, I'm going to be talking to one of the true true legends of the Seattle guitar scene, Kurt Block. Kurt is probably best known for his guitar work in the band The Fastbacks, but he's been doing a lot more than just that. Uh, He has produced records by the Presidents of the United States of America, Robin Hitchcock, and The Minus Five. He currently plays in Filthy Friends, the newest band fronted by Corin Tucker of Slater Kinney and featuring Peter Buck of R.E.M., This year, he also unveiled a band and record called the Yes Masters that everyone should go check out. He's just one of those essential people around Seattle who uh, remind me that even though our city is rapidly changing and evolving, um, the roots of Seattle's music scene are still around. He just always has a smile on his face and is just everywhere at every venue. I run into him all over town. I even ran into him on an Amtrak train to Portland a few weeks back. Anyways, we talk about a lot, the fastbacks, the formation of the fastbacks, some of the crazy gear stories he's accumulated over the years, his current kind of part-time gig working for the Gibson Corporation, and a lot more. I hope you enjoy it. Before we get to that, speaking of the Pacific Northwest music scene, uh, our friends at Retrofit Vintage Guitars, who are sponsoring this episode, have a bit of Pacific Northwest history for sale right now in their Brooklyn showroom, a a Knutson Jumbo 11 string harp guitar. That is from 1912, 105 years ago. They say it sounds exceptional. It even comes with what's left of the original case. Someone should check that out. It is a work of art. It is a thing of beauty. They also have a 1959 Martin 018 and 1948 Rickenbacker Ace M88 that is loaded with patina, a 33 Gibson L50, and a 65 Magnetone Typhoon x20 all in their new arrivals section of their site go over to retrofret.com to see all of the stuff they have uh currently for sale and by all means don't uh hesitate to hit them up if you need any repair or restoration work they do exceptional work and if you are anywhere near new york go to their brooklyn showroom it is a thing to behold our other sponsor today is dying breed music lane over at dying breed of course specializes in flat top vintage guitars of the golden era you've heard me say this before right now he's got a 1939 martin 0021 that is 100 percent original and repair free he's got a long scale 1934 martin 0018 that was just set up by the legendary john arnold and he's got a 1941 gibson j35 that is all original minus the tuner buttons and the bridge pins that one has a repaired crack so you can save a little bit of money off that one because it's a player's guitar um, if vintage flat top guitars are your thing, give Lane a call over at 870-818-3434 and talk shop with him. He can walk you through his inventory, the consignment program, and much more. And you can also go over to dyingbreedguitars.com to see his inventory if you don't feel like talking to him on the phone. All right, here is my conversation with Kurt Block. Thanks, everybody, for supporting the Fretboard Journal podcast and for subscribing to the Fretboard Journal print magazine. I'm going to leave this uh, intro short. If you want to see what we're up to, if you want to see any of our new content, head on over to fretboardjournal.com and uh, set aside an hour or so because we've got a lot over there, including a lot of new videos and columns and a bunch more. We're going live right we're now. live, the Fretboard Journal podcast. Kurt Block, thanks for being here. Hi there. Glad to be here. You uh, you are obviously a, uh, a legend of sorts in the Seattle music world. I see you everywhere, often <laughs> with a smile and a guitar. <laughs> on the train, <laughs> on airplanes, trains. Yes, we ran Any into each other on the train. transportation, for sure. When, uh, did you grow up in Seattle? Yeah, I was born here. Which, which part of town? Um, Sandpoint, kind of... Yeah. Uh, uh, north of Matthews Beach, yeah, Sandpoint, Lake City ish. And at what point did music and guitar take over? Um, let me think about that for a second. Definitely, since I was maybe you know nine or ten, I was super into super into music and you know buying records. And originally, we'd just go buy records at the thrift store. The 
you know, the Salvation Army or the Goodwill or the St. Vincent de Paul down on Lake Union. Yeah. They had a, you know, crazy store down there that, I mean, my dad would go there every every now and then and, and uh, you know, just look for look for stuff, projects and stuff like that. And, yeah. And then, then at some point, listening to songs on the radio and saying, like, oh, I could actually go buy this actual song. Because I knew what records, we always had records since we were little kids, but at some point it occurred to me that you could go buy the actual songs you heard on the radio. The two sort of existed in a, in a separate world. It wasn't a lottery system. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and I didn't, it didn't, didn't quite understand. But oh, you go to the, you know, the pay and save or yeah. something, and, and they had records, and, and and it wasn't quite aware of that there was a hierarchy to uh, music on the radio stations either. So you'd go and think you could. Well, they only have forty different songs here. What if you want one they don't have? Oh, I kind of out of luck, you know, so you better find something they do have. Yeah. And then they, you know, the stores would have the list of the top 40 songs and the ones you could buy. It's like, oh, this is all, all kind of making sense now. And then started buying, you know, current records on the, on the radio and, and listening to, to music. And, and then I suppose it was when I got into junior high school, um, my sister had, had gone to Nathan Hale there in uh, sort of be, betwixt Sandpoint and Lake City. Uh-huh. <clears throat> She'd gone there a year before I did, maybe two years, one or two, one or two years. And um, she had an acoustic guitar and said, oh, yeah, one of the classes you can take at school is guitar. I was like, what? You can play guitar at school <laughs> that didn't seem to really you know and she would you know be playing her john denver songs and and uh, leaving on a jet plane and things like that it's like gosh when i started junior high school i i, I want to play guitar too no it wasn't junior high school it was high school mm-hmm. was it geez now i'm now i'm mixing them all up but uh <laughs> at some point it was it was high school rather than junior high school because okay. um, I, I I believe my uh, I, I borrowed my sister's guitar and brought it to high school folk guitar class. It was in one of the portables, so yeah, yeah, no, okay. it definitely was Nathan Hill rather than Jane Adams across the street. And um, and then for that that Christmas, which would have been only what school starts in September, right? Yeah, it would have been only a few months later. I was like asked my parents if I could have an electric guitar. And, you know, my mom was probably like, mm, well, that sounds annoying. And my dad was like, I kind of like electric guitar, you know, kind of fun project. My dad was an engineer, a tinkerer, okay. a machinist, an electronics guy. And um, so he's like, yeah, let's, let's go find you, find you an electric guitar. And, um, some of the more musician savvy people said, Oh, don't, don't just go buy a, you know, cheap $99 new guitar. You should look for a, a good brand, a used, a used good brand of, you know, guitar. And it's like, we didn't quite know. So I ended up with a, uh, with a pan brand SG copy. Okay. Which certainly, you know, was with, within the uh, series of, cheap you know Japanese guitars of, of of its time and which makes me laugh now because I still have it and um looking at it now it probably played it as it was for a couple months and then you know started carving it up and well let's you want to put a different pickup in there but I don't really know the difference between you know you, you don't really know what anything does all you know is it's time to start <laughs> moving things changing they said a couple of buddies that had nice instruments you know like maybe a uh a, a les paul or a es335 or something it's like wow yeah i really like playing this guitar better than this one you know it just sounds so much better maybe and uh, you know i l- l- think of playing guitar back then and 
we didn't have any money. I certainly didn't have any money. So strings would break and you'd retie a new ball in <laughs> onto the back of it. And, you know, you'd start losing some of the string length. So the windings, you'd be all notched and <laughs> gouged up strings. And so nothing would really work. I had absolutely no idea how to tune guitars. Yeah. You know, there were no pedal tuners or no anything at all like that. And listening to some of the uh, recordings of our first bands and, you know, between every song there's boom, 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 you know, like shooting. It's like, what were you uh, plugging the the pan guitar into? um, Well, I was pretty lucky early on. um, I think Kim Warnick for the, the, the bass player in the fastbacks, she had borrowed um, from her, or she, I think she, her parents had rented her a guitar and amp from, you know, one of the music stores sure. to see if, you know, see if she'd take up playing music. So she had a, a Fender Champ that we played that I that she let me play for a while, but it didn't last very long. I think just being, you know, it sounds cool. If you turn it up all the way, you know, it sounds kind of what you'd want a guitar to sound like. But it blew out in the first week or something <laughs> like that. And it's like, okay, oh, I, boy, I hope we don't have to pay for this. And she brought it back and got a new one, but I was like, okay, probably not the best idea. But somewhere along the line, I ended up with a, uh, a Fender Tremolux head All right. and, and some bizarre, I was, you know, one of these high school deals of, oh yeah, do you want, you want to buy all this stuff? Do you want to buy some music stuff? There was a Univox 335 copy. Okay. And a Tremolux head and a, a 410s cabinet <laughs> um, and this 212s cabinet that somebody had built in wood shop or something like that. And I think we use, I think, um, I think ultimately I put the two twelves and put the four tens on top of that and then put the Tremolux head on top <laughs> of that and just turned it all the way up. And it sounded pretty killer, you know, for not, for always wanting a, a, a you know, Les Paul and a Marshall or an SG and a Marshall growing up, you know, it was probably a pretty good first stamp to have. Um, there again, listening to some of the recordings, I was like, well, if, if, that that you could have a worse guitar sound for <laughs> you know being a 16 year old kid that didn't that knew absolutely nothing about anything mm-hmm. um and it's like well yep it was what about probably 18 watts or something like that yeah so you could turn it all the way up. it wasn't particularly loud either i don't think you know maybe it was it could have had a problem with it or maybe it just wasn't that loud if you turned it all the way up but it did. It did sort of sound like the Sex Pistols or something like that. Or yeah, didn't quite. Maybe didn't quite sound like UFO or Thin Lizzy. But it, you know, maybe had the the. You know, you could do a, a kind of Sex Pistolsy sort of sound. And and then I think I like the pickups in the Univox guitar better. So I think I took one of the pickups out of that and tried to put it in the SG, which required some. And I didn't have a router. I didn't really know how that was all supposed to work. But you know, you could put a get a drill and start drilling holes in it. And, you know, <laughs> chisel away. Chisel, drill and chisel for sure is the next best thing. Yeah. You know, my my dad wasn't didn't do that much woodworking. He was kind of a metal shop guy, so there was tons of tools to you know cut metal with but using a drill press to do the holes and moving the guitar around right right or... <laughs> drilling a bunch of holes in and then chiseling <laughs> them out you know just exactly what uh you would not want but you know got the job done and the univox pickup was a little bit higher output than the pan pickup yeah um because i think i think i you know started you started i don't know if this thing is this is dropping dropping down oh i see probably this yeah it's sturdy I think it was just it was just tilting down from there, but uh, you know, just uh, I think one of the first things I did after taking apart the pan guitar to just, I mean, that was always the first thing you do with anything you would get. Was Didn't that matter just what the it was? Take your it dad had instilled in you, or you were just that kind of kid? I was just that kind of kid, and my yeah. dad was. I, I don't. I don't think you know. He was always well. You better be careful taking things apart because. 
sometimes they're harder to put back together than you think. It's like, oh no, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm invincible. I can do anything. And but of course, you're not invincible. Invincible, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that's. But I guess then you screw something up. You ruin your guitar. You don't know how to put it back together, and you have a show to play with it. So it makes you figure out. It makes you figure out how to get it together, and yeah. Oh well, I better learn how all these things work um, because otherwise I'm not going to have a guitar. Cause yeah, I'm already too far uh, into this to. Uh, <laughs> I'm further than I should be. Yeah, you're off the deep taking end. Taking stuff yeah. apart. So then, when uh, did you form the band? Like well, how that was. I think that was we had our band, the Cheaters, at that point. Okay. And what were you playing? Where? What kind of music? Oh, it, uh, the Cheaters were definitely a, um, an adventurous punk band. Okay. I think in some ways we wanted, we would have been happy to be a straight ahead, just na 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 kind of kind of band. But I think we're maybe a little, we were maybe a year or two too old. You know, the Cheaters. We were probably sixteen when the Cheaters started, maybe seventeen. And so we'd, we'd listen to all this other kind of music and, and I almost seem to remember being down there trying to play Blue Oyster Cult songs and you know, music that was, that was way beyond our, our, our <laughs> ability level. Um, and then the first, first hearing the Sex Pistols and the Damned and the Clash and the Ramones too... We're like, well, we can play this kind of music. Yeah. And so it was just our neighborhood band. It was me and my brother. My brother played bass, and our next door neighbor, Scott, was a singer. And a, our buddy that lived down the street, Dave, was the drummer. <clears throat> and so we're like, well, we can, you know, play songs off the first Ramones record, and we yeah. can play like the Sex Pistols and, and New Rose and Neat, Neat, Neat. We can. You know, we can get through those and listen to the, you know, first tapes we have. We're playing that kind of songs as well as um, Hot Rails to Hell by Blue Oyster Cult. Uh -huh. you know, we, we always were and always trying to go for something that we couldn't quite get. So um, and a lot of it is just is really terrible. But over the course of the year 1978, you can... You know, each practice tape there that we made is much better than the one before it until the end. And it's like, well, we could have been an okay band if we <laughs> if we could have kept from fighting and you know kept from breaking up. You know, if we if we had kept on with it, yeah, we could have been uh, we could have we could have you know been a little we could have done something maybe. But um, you know, just like a a group of people that were thrown together for no other reason than that's the only people that you had to play with. You know, people had different ideas about what they thought the band should be. Mm -hmm. And, 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 uh, there was, you know, just a lot of actual, actual fighting. Yeah. They were just your neighbors, right? Yeah. Yeah. The... It was my brother and, and the neighbors. And so there was, there was some actual in our, our last show, Ended in a in a fist fight that rolled out onto wow. the street, and uh, just also looking at, you know, just going through boxes of old stuff and seeing some posters. There, we we did have a show in in Vancouver, BC. In uh, it must have been uh, oh geez, like the the month, like the following month, we broke up at a Halloween show. Okay. And so it must have been um, the following the following month. We were going to go up to Vancouver, and we never never made it. But there was a poster for it, so we we almost got out of the country. Your folks <laughs> were going to let a bunch of sixteen year old kids go play. Well, by that point, you know, we were eighteen. 19, oh, you were eighteen. So okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And how you know we must have been quite ambitious to yeah. 
But I think we've been going up to Vancouver a little bit too because they had, you know, bands we like play up there, and mm-hmm. and you know we knew there was, we knew there was some kind of scene. Yeah, we knew there was, we knew there was life outside of Seattle. Yeah, and then what was the next band? Did you did you just jump into an, another band right after? Or? Yes, because the drummer of the Cheaters had left his drums um, in my parents' basement okay. where we practiced. It's convenient. And um, and so there was a drum set there and I was bummed that the Cheaters had, you know, blown up and irrebuildable... Ir- ir- you know, nobody nobody wanted to have anything to do with each other at that point, and so I went down and started playing drums. Okay, and um, I thought, well, I'll get a you know, see what I can do as far as putting a, a, a another band together. But in the meantime, um, our friends Kim and Lulu from the Fast Facts, who we went to high school with. Uh-huh. They're like, well, let's start a band. I was like, okay, well, I'm just learning how to play drums, so this should be good. And and Kim had already been in a band at that point, and Lulu hadn't. So we started the Fastbacks probably in late 1979. Okay. And our first show was, you know, early 1980, March or May or something like that. So we didn't we didn't waste any time. Uh, get some songs together and, and, you know, doing our first show. Yeah. And just, just thinking it was something to do to, you know, play music until I could, you know, get another band going. And then that ultimately seemed like it was pretty fun. We were just a three piece to start with. And, and then I think we moved out of my parents' basement and moved into Kimmer Lulu's basement and, practiced and did a bunch of shows throughout 1980 and then then one uh, one summer we were sitting around not doing anything and Duff McKagan came over who was whose mom lived in the same neighborhood that Kim and Lulu's house was in in, in Wedgwood mm-hmm. and, or Ravenna actually and um, he's like well nobody has anything to do today why don't we go down and practice I'll play drums and you play guitar, ah, because um, you're good guitar player. It seems like it sound, your band would sound pretty good if it had some good guitar. And it's like, I was like, nah, it's stupid. I was like, oh, we don't have anything else to do. It's like, okay, yeah, good point. <laughs> so he we went down there and he played drums and I played guitar and we're like, ah, oh, this is a lot better band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds better having a better drummer and a better guitar player. And okay, so. I don't think I don't we never went never changed that was that yeah. was how that sort of lineup started and then Duff lasted into the into 1981 for a little while and then he I mean there was so much arguing and bickering and so he finally quit and um you know we went on our rotation of drummers of drummers dozens of them <laughs> Have you ever kept a count how many drummers the Fastbacks had? Um, there is a there is a website. the The Fastback superfan Scott Lee has a website with all the uh, all the stats. Okay, all arranged uh, in uh, in various pie charts and graphs and things okay. like that. I think he even knows not not only every drummer but their uh, percentage of recorded material. Wow, are we talking triple digits or double digits? Of drummers, yeah, I, th- I think you know they're definitely not triple digits um, unless you you have like a decimal point and uh, <laughs> yeah. you know does this there's you know some uh, there's at least two drummers that only did one show with us. Okay, I mean we we we, we burn very hot. Um, there's a you know there's a big workload definitely in the '80s for sure. The the music was once again you know, beyond our skill set and the arguments and, and just, you know, complaining and yelling and fighting, actually fighting, you know, for some reason that, that kept 
that kept on. And so I think for the most part, the drummers were just like, this is ridiculous. I wanted, I wanted to be in this band because it was a cool band and I like you people and I want to play the songs. And then you end up, you know, just being in the middle of all this people storming out of practice or throwing their instruments at each other. And it's like, ah. So it wasn't so much hate on the drummer. It was just the drummer was an innocent bystander. Well, the drummer was an innocent bystander and, and, you know, quickly finds out they have, uh, you know, walked into a minefield of of what I don't know. I, 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 you know, you kind of forget the parts that you remember, you can laugh off, but I'm sure it wasn't funny back then. Sure. When did you do the, what was the first recording? When was that? Our first recording was for um, this compilation album called The Seattle Syndrome. Okay. It's an LP. It's got a pink cover. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, the, I think it was, it was recorded in 1980. So it was just trying to document the Seattle music scene Mm -hmm. of the time. Which it did, which it did quite well. There's, a lot, a lot of different kinds of music on it, and they're all, all it's all pretty good. There's, mm-hmm. and of course, most of them are my friends from back then. But, um, and I think we went in to go record our song for that, and always, you know, studio time, especially back then, was hard to come by. And so I was like, well, if we're gonna do this, can we just record, you know, four songs and see which one we like the best oh sure that sounds fun so we recorded four band tracks and and recorded vocals for four of the songs i think and then we mixed the one for the compilation and then went back you know a few days later and mixed a couple more which was our first single okay and then which would have come out in 1981 i suppose yeah and just kind of kept going from there you put that first one out yourself? Yeah, it was on my label, No Threes Records, which also put out the Cheaters and Okay. And in the early eighties, we put out a put out a few handful of forty fives yeah. and a couple of fastbacks twelve inch records and 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 stuff. What does no threes mean? Uh, nothing. We thought it sounded sinister and um uh, you know, we still, still like, well, I guess the no threes label was the cheaters made a 45 and it was on no threes. Okay. Records. And, um, sort of a, a nod to the blue oyster cult. And we liked the blue oyster cult symbol and we liked, you know, not, we weren't necessarily big on having band logos, but a, a band symbol was cool. You know, we liked the Oyster Cult. We liked the Radio Birdman. We liked the the bands that seemed a little like sinister, and and it didn't have to. You know, like there was the, like there was something more that not everybody was to know about. Yeah, you know, it's like a something a little bit secret. Cool. And the No Threes had nothing to do with anything really, but we made <laughs> a uh, we made a, a street sign. Okay. We didn't make it. We took a street sign and, you know, with a ch- ch- the round thing with the slash through it. Yeah. We made a no three sign, which was which we'd bring to all the cheaters shows. I think we probably had that long before there was the record label. We had the no threes sign just to uh, just give to people pause. <laughs> yeah, give give people pause. <laughs> Give people something to think about. Yeah, yeah. Then when it came time to make a record label, was no question that it would be No Threes Records. Wow. And are you working like day jobs throughout this part? And are you just a full time guitarist trying to make this thing work? Oh, in the, the like, no, I have just the worst jobs. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't really have. Uh, crap I don't remember <laughs> just whatever <clears throat> yeah I remember doing you know odd jobs and painting office furniture painting metal office furniture like on weekends and you know doing oh, working on people's houses tearing out walls and just doing anything you can to make some money not very not very ambitious to get a job yeah but 
clearly there was less money to be had playing music then than there is now. I mean, you would really not make any money. And, you know, so playing, playing drums, you'd break your bass drum head and you'd be done. There'd be no... There'd be there'd be no way around it. There's no way to patch that up. To patch it up, you didn't. There's no money to go buy a thirty dollar bass drum head. You know, you break a string. It's like we have to take twenty minutes to find the little thing that broke off and tie it back on. And I mean, there was, it was like nobody had any money at all. Yeah, which is which is just terrible. I mean, what if? the 20 year old me well, I guess that's not true I did have a job at the record store in the U district at uh, second time around the used mm -hmm. record store there I did that's where I saved that money to buy my first first after I had the pan guitar yeah the first um, you know semi regular guitar no 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 okay I had the pan guitar then I bought a, a Gibson Melody Maker okay for a hundred and $35 I think from the newspaper and I had that at the end of the cheaters I, I, I remember having that but still it wasn't you know it was it had the regular melody maker pickup in it and it wasn't really what exactly I knew it isn't, it isn't exactly what I wanted and so I was working at the record store and I thought man, going into uh, Friedman's Loans on First Avenue sure down there <clears throat> And they had a 67, 68-ish SG Special. I was like, wow, there it is. <laughs> That's the one, you know, because even at that point, the Who Live at Leeds was absolutely the, the record yeah. of all time. The greatest guitar sound and the greatest of everything. And, and you know, we just look at pictures of Pete Townsend playing that guitar like god it must be a magic guitar i mean there must be something about that exact guitar because you can hear him flipping the switches and turning the pickups up and down mm -hmm. you know in the in bits of songs and it's like that guitar is the key to everything good and we didn't, i'd never seen one before you just see pictures in magazines and that's all you wouldn't actually ever see any cool guitars so somehow you think they must have only made a you know like 30 of them or something that must be really rare yeah because all we have is Yamahas and Ibanez and and stuff like that you never saw these mythical you know guitars from the 60s or the 50s and there was one at Friedman's Loan so I was like I have to have that it's like well you can put it on layaway I didn't have any money yeah you know but if you can come up with you know 50 bucks you can put on lower I believe it was $235 $240 or something like that and have to do it and um, so I rounded up the money and put the down payment on it and went went there every time I got paid and put another 50 bucks on it or whatever and yeah went and picked it up I remember taking the bus down there from the record store in the district and finally I get the guitar today went down there and got it and and so that was the first you know the first proper guitar that I had yeah and I had the, the twin reverb, which, you know, was very unsuitable. <laughs> yeah. But probably bought it for a hundred bucks from somebody and it, it was an amp and it was loud. But, you know, in nineteen eighty the like somehow the distortion pedals that were available then, I think maybe a, maybe rats were just coming out. I don't think I don't think we knew rats at that point. Okay. Which, you know, would have been huge. Would have been the right. Would have been the perfect thing. There was a distortion plus, but at that time I didn't have that. I went uh, went to American Music and you know, without having any money, your 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 options are, are very limited. But I, I remember just saying like, what what do you have that makes distortion for guitars that's not super expensive? Oh, we have this. Well, you know, everything was, you know, 80 bucks or $100 sure. or something like, because I, th I think the Distortion Plus pedal was what I wanted because maybe I'd seen some band use that 
and think, okay, that, that does the right thing. But um, in my case, I think it was a $30 uh, Big Muff, uh -huh. which, you know, it's like that was all there was, one of the kind of bent metal, yeah, you know, old Big Muffs. And it's like, oh, well, this this will be cool. Plugging it. It's like, well, that doesn't sound like UFO or Judas Priest <laughs> or Sex Pistols or, you know, it doesn't sound like any of those... Yeah, this is not what I want. And I want to have a pedal. I just want to be able to plug into an amp and get that sound. You know, you what you really wanted is a you know fifty watt Marshall and yeah. a four twelves. You know, but like eh, those are five hundred dollars. I don't have that, so this thing will have to work. So I used that a little bit and was never happy with it. And you know, always looking in the in the early or in the early eighties for an amp that you know, made that sound that didn't cost $500. Yeah. And we'd always look in the newspaper and the little nickel wand ads and mm -hmm. just looking for cool stuff that wasn't expensive. And I think I, I should have, if I was smart, I would have just dragged the Tremolux head out of the, out of the basement and just used that. But for some reason I, at, at that point, I didn't think it sounded right. It didn't sound good to me. Whereas, you know, listening to even just recording of a show with it, it's like, that sounds great. Yeah. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that sound. But I remember buying a uh, Sound City 120 watt head <laughs> with the six output tubes and <laughs> getting that. And it's like, okay, this is cool. I've seen Pete Townsend play SG with Sound City. That's got to be good. And I was like, wow, this just, this just didn't. You know, it was just twank, 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 twank. And if you could go play it somewhere where you could turn it all the way up, but that's just not not going to happen. So I started thinking about it, and, and the tinkerer in me was, well, what it needs is an extra preamp stage. Clearly, you know, the 22-year-old me was <laughs> thinking beyond his ability. Your dad his, taught his you well. Yeah. Well, but yeah, my dad was a, an electronics guy, but he was not a not a guitar amp guy. Yeah, so sure. everything that he was thinking of was to do away with distortion. Sure. And he didn't like distorted guitar sounds. He loved guitar playing, and he loved electric guitar, but it was, you know, Jorgen Ingman or someone like that, or, you know, someone that had great, clear, nice tone. So he he understood the idea that we wanted that we that I was looking for something different, but was wasn't really able to uh, able to help. Although he did help me build the first guitar that I built, which was another crazy story. But Does that come later? It can. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, so I, we have this Sound City 120 watt head, which must have been on in the little nickel one ads for, you know, $100, $120 or something. Maybe we got a 412 cabinet that went with it too. Um, and I was like, how, okay, how do we, how do I make this, you know, sound like all the bands that we liked? I was like, it's gotta have, it's gotta have more preamp gain. So just took it apart, turn it over, start looking at it. It's like, okay, well, there's an extra tube socket here. And I asked my dad, it's like, well, is it okay to put an extra tube in an amp? Can you just do that? And he looked at it and like, he says, well, the transformers are big. I, I don't think that it's, you know, like a preamp tube is not going to draw that much more current. And certainly the, the filament, part of the transformer is probably fine it's one more tube is not going to draw all that much more current okay cool so i just duplicated the first preamp stage and put it before the first preamp stage so wow i put an extra tube socket there was there was not an extra tube socket but the holes were there for extra tubes yeah for whatever reason i you know i have no idea but so i put another another 12 ax7 in there and just drew out the circuit of the first preamp stage and duplicate it for the for the in front of the other one and fired it up it didn't blow up and and it had <laughs> it was like wow that 
sounds cool to me. <laughs> wow, I must be pretty good at electronics because <laughs> I got that. So I played with that a few months and and the, the first recording we did with that, <clears throat> the first recording we did with that um, was at, uh, what was the studio in um, Fremont in uh, a Crow recording down there. Um, it was, well, it's been a few studios since then. Okay. But we went in there for a day <clears throat> and record, recorded our band tracks. And and I listening to the playback of that, I was just unhappy with it. Oh, this isn't, yeah, it just sounds stupid. It doesn't, it doesn't sound right. Just really sad and upset. And this, this isn't very good. I'm just not happy with this at all. Can't you do anything about it to the engineer who... <laughs> like, oh. and he, he pulls me aside and he's like hey buddy I, I don't know you I've never heard your band before or anything but that app sounds great you should be really happy with the sound it, it sounds killer and I was like no it's just not not what I want so so we just left after the day and recorded our four four tunes and ultimately went to another studio and re-recorded the guitar parts and and then just a couple of years ago I found the original two inch sixteen track tapes and some of the some of the songs had the original guitar yeah playing on them from that session. You know, it sounds killer. It's like what is the matter with people? Like what was wrong with me? Why didn't I <laughs> and so I ended up remixing some of the songs and like, wow, the the original live guitar track sounds way better than the one I overdubbed. I don't know what was. You use the same amp for the no, overdub, like, but by, by that point, the Sound City I couldn't use you that couldn't, anymore. Oh, okay, it was, like, it was it was I couldn't. It was clearly not not good enough, or didn't you know? I'd been shat. My my dreams had been shattered at that point. It's like <laughs> I guess I don't know that much about how to build amps, which of course I knew nothing about how to build amps. I'm lucky that. It didn't blow up, and I didn't get electrocuted. Really, did you but sell it like the way? You... Of course, I still have it. You still have it? <laughs> of course. <laughs> you, have you played you know, it? I pil- I, no, I, I pilfered all the output tubes out. Oh, of okay, it for sure. So to fire it up again, I'd need six more uh, six L sixes. I have a feeling you got some six L sixes floating around your house. Well, yeah, but I mean six. Well, I guess probably EL thirty fours to get. Yeah, you know, a, a matched set of those. I will do it someday. Yeah, no, I will. See if it survives. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I. Oh yeah, and then and I also put a fan and I cut a hole in the side of it and got a fan because I thought, wow, with the extra tube, it might get too hot. So I better. Uh, wow, put a, I, you're making yeah. trips to Radio Shack and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm Radio Shack. I mean, now you can buy so much stuff on the internet, but back then, you'd have to go down to what was the Radar Electric down on mm. uh, Western Avenue. You'd, go there and you know try to find parts and stuff and they'd have all the components the regular components you wanted but some of the odd guitar specific things you couldn't find there yeah now were you uh besides the tinkering you did were you hard on guitars when you played with the fastbacks <laughs> yeah, you might say yeah yeah <laughs> there's there's one uh one photo of the cheaters playing where it was Playing the playing the guitar with a saw, like not like a handsaw, like a handsaw, not the smooth part. Of it. <laughs> and the, the 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 pan SG copy that I have has like saw marks. All right, you know it didn't didn't actually cut all the way through, but there's there's <laughs> it, it started it, it it was it was on its way. Um, and you know I was pretty hard on guitars like never really you know I never never want to actually break them sure you know but it's like always pushing things to the point like sometimes things get broken and, but usually I've found usually when guitars get broken it's not because you threw them around when playing them almost every guitar that I've ever had a broken headstock on has been either flying with it yeah or it's sitting on a stand on a stage 
and someone knocking it over. Yeah. For whatever reason, I mean, I hate guitar stands. I will never, I will never, given the choice, use a, a traditional guitar stand. Sure. Just because at shows, the number of guitars I've broken by you know throwing them around at a show versus breaking them sitting on a guitar stand at the show the the guitar stand has broken more of them yeah and maybe that's just superstition or or something but they just you know i think i i, I think it's if there's a guitar on a stand on a stage people think it's safe nothing it's going to be fine and if you lean it up against the amp, then people are like, oh, boy, I better not get close to that. Yeah. But kicking a guitar stand over or like that's usually what happens. Somebody will kick it over, but always by accident or they're, you know, you plug sticking into it and somebody trips on the cord or, yeah. or whatever. If you lean it against the wall or up against an amp, I found that to be the far safer. superior, safer way to uh, to store your instrument between sets or you know, yeah, or whenever. So you're, you're clearly a DIY kind of guy. Are you fixing the guitars that you've damaged in shows? Are you yeah. pretty early on? Oh, oh for sure. Yeah. Jeez, some of these, some of these ones are like even uh, the Young Fresh Fellows were just brutal on instruments, and um, we got to the point where I'd bring a bottle of wood glue and some clamps and all, all matter of guitar repair stuff in the van just in case and I bring two guitars <clears throat> but there was one one that you know it was maybe the designated throw around guitar and it was it was it had been broken several times um, and there was the, the one of them that had a had a Floyd Rose on it I think uh -huh. it was a it was a Kramer of some sort that you know clearly was cut up and repurposed bits and pieces and stuff, but it had broken past the Floyd Rose. So the headstock was broken off and dangling by the strings, but you could still play it. It was still, it was still in tune. It's, you, know, you still have the little fine tuners there. So definitely played that for a few shows with the headstock <laughs> dangling from the, from like the an air one. freshener in a taxi <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly a tree air freshener <laughs> in your car um and so that was that was that was pretty funny but then it's like ah, i don't really need a floyd rose and then at some point um at some point you start playing better guitars yeah and appreciating the finer points of of nicer made guitars and then you figure out you just maybe don't want to throw them around quite as much yeah. because you know it's one thing to break up and repair a headstock on a $150 Kramer guitar and then you you know play in a nice SG or Wilshire or something like that it's like well, I don't I would be really sad if I broke it <laughs> I don't know I don't want to break it. I don't care if it gets another dent in it or something because it's clearly got plenty of those but I don't want to ruin it. Yeah. And, you know, still you test that to this day. There's a lot of things that are testing that, that, that line, how far you can push it and, you know, scraping the guitars together, like blue Easter cult. And, you know, it's like, Oh, that's the dumbest thing. It's so easy to get the little dent in the fret. And then yeah. the, the, that's a non-starter, you know, you have a dent in that fret and you're not going to be happy about it. Yeah. And, you can't just fill it in with anything, you know, you have to change the fret. Yeah. And that's not something you can do in the van. Yeah. You know, while you're on tour. I suppose at this point I probably could. You yeah. Know, are you so are you totally self taught on the guitar tech front and, and working on all this stuff? Uh, ye yes. Other than what my buddy Brian Nelson showed me back in the eighties. Okay. Buddy that was uh, that was and is a guitar builder and guitar tech, um, but yeah, all trial by fire. It's like well, I don't have any, you know. I'd love to love to take it to somebody and get a fret job or frets replaced or any of those things, but you know, they just didn't have any money, so you just you, you end up ruining some things. Yeah, but 
I think that's if you're going to learn how to be a guitar tech. I mean, I, I at this point, I wish I would have gone to a luthier school and learned how to be a better woodworker because that would be very, very good for me to have a better, better set of woodworking skills. Yeah. But, you know. Are there guitar, guitar designs in your head that no one's executed that you would love to see come no, about? No, actually not. I was just, just thinking woodworking skills for repairing yeah. things and, and building fake guitar copies and, sure. and, and, and just really just screwing around. Really, there's, I, I don't think, I, I, I don't see, I don't have any guitar designs in my head that I like better than an Epiphone Cornet or a Les Paul Jr. or a SG. I mean, really, those guitars are what I what I like. And there's, for, you know, for everyday use, there's all kinds of guitars that are great for special, yeah. special purposes and stuff. But, I, you know, I don't think, there's, there's nothing that I envision i mean i'm not like a bunch of little switches kind of guy yeah i mean a favorite guitar was les paul jr sg jr coronet something like that just pick up and two controls i do like to have a neck pickup yeah because <clears throat> I, I do like that sound and, and use it a lot but a lot of my favorite guitars don't have it so you just learn how to do without it yeah Whereas the people with the micro switches and all the push pull things and stuff like that's like, yeah, nah, just turn it down, put yeah. it on one or six, you know, have, use your volume control, use the tone. The tone control is usually all the way on mm -hmm. a little bit off or all the way off, you know, don't sit there diddling with that too much, but you know, usually all the way on, if it's too trebly, turn it down a little bit till you need a little more treble, but, or turn it off to get the sort of sound, but you know, you just, I, I just, I just don't think that way. I don't need 30 pedals and, you know, it, it's just not the way my musical brain works mm -hmm. to add more things, to add more things to think about while you're trying to play. It's hard enough to play just regular. <laughs> <laughs> like what if you have these switches or amps that have like two rows of knobs and all these things to adjust like, Jeez, you know, what if you set it up and you're not going to be able to change anything while you're playing a show? Yeah. Because you, my vision is not that good. I can't <laughs> go over there. Like you get an AC30 or something and the controls are on the top and you the knobs go backwards or, you know, it's like, ah, no, 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 no. Just, you know, one good sound is 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 enough yeah <laughs> for me anyway other people seem to have great luck with all kinds of things but yeah. uh, just like the the simplest things and then but make whatever's there work good i mean i like to have i like to have nice strings and frets that are not all worn out and i like all those nice things yeah or at least those two nice things <laughs> <laughs> I like to be able to, to play, and you know, I know where all the controls are on on most of the guitars I have without without looking down there. You know, whether it's SG or Les Paul, where the switch is, and you know where all the the things are. Yeah, just like get that stuff to be sort of second nature, so you're not thinking of not having to think about all the things that don't involve directly playing. I mean, you know, maybe that's just my brain is wired simply like that to try to make the make the best of what little is there. Yeah. You mentioned a lot of Gibson brands. You you work for Gibson now, right? Yeah, I work. At, I'm, I'm the guitar tech for the uh, Gibson um, Entertainment Relations Office. Okay. In Seattle. Which was no is it was it once known as the showroom Gibson showroom? The Gibson showroom. Yeah. yeah, it is. It 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 is a showroom. It's not it's not open to the public. So no. it's sort of a sort of a mixed bag as far as you know you think of the word showroom you think of somewhere you can go uh yeah go just 
hang out like a car, new car showroom or something. No, like you got to be invited to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's it's not a retail space and it's not a uh, not a public showroom, so slightly slightly difficult there. But um, you know, we send guitars around for various things, and they definitely a lot of uh, a lot of FedEx and you know. <laughs> Every now and then, there's there's I'm I'm not not blaming FedEx in particular. Yeah, I mean sometimes there's stuff that comes back that's that's been uh, you, usually usually if there's anything wrong with the guitar, it was it was put in the box that way. Yeah, <laughs> from the person using it. But you know sometimes the the harder touring bands that we might loan instruments to there's there's you know lots of lots of little things to do to uh, yeah you know to test your. Uh, guitar tech prowess yeah so it's almost like a, a lending library of guitars kind of yes thing. exactly yeah. all right yeah and you've got to you've got to fix them up yeah they gotta they look gotta look good and, and and play good so that the next person that gets them has anyone just trashed one? Oh yeah yeah for sure there's <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and you know sometimes I, I, I give up it's like this is this is beyond our um, scope here as a uh, as a uh, entertainment relations office. <laughs> it's more like a, a a clinic rather than a hospital. Yeah. Um. Like you know, a hospital, a guitar hospital would have a drill press. It would have you know some woodworking tools. It would have you know a table with clamps and. Yeah. Things, you know, whereas the clinic, a cracked headstock can simply glue that, glue clamp it and, you know, try to make it look a little less gnarly. But, um, you know, anything that's anything that's really and truly broken, mm -hmm. you're probably, you know, not, not going to be taking that on. Yeah. You know, fret with a uh, that's been scraped against another guitar and, and has a ding in it. I can, you know. Try to put a new fret in there, yeah, and sh 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 make it match. But uh, rather not really, <laughs> rather, you know. Rather have the people that, that that do get the guitars from there, you know, try to take reasonable care of them. But yeah, even even so, stuff breaks. The kind of the kind of music we like is is uh, you know prone to uh, guitar malfunctions and and yeah. breakage saw marks. <laughs> prone to breakage yeah yeah <laughs> so what else you've got a you always have like a half dozen bands going it seems like or at least these days yeah there's, you get the there's filthy friends is kind of getting a ton of yeah publicity. filthy friends going and we've got some shows coming up next year for sure and some uh some re uh reinvigorating um the alejandro escovito band we've been playing between those shows and those have been super fun and also prone to breakage. Yes. Like a, like a, you know, like a good uh, little kick-ass punkoid band that it can be. There's, there's been some, there's been some things cracked on that, uh, on those trips. Now he, he knows how to rock out and you do as well. What's yeah, the, yeah. sort of the setup there when you're back? Are you backing him or what, how, how does that work? Well, it's basically, uh, I play guitar, yeah. Scott McCoy plays bass, Peter Buck plays guitar, and Linda Pittman on drums. And we can, that, that band can be, at this point, it could be the minus five. Okay. It could be the Peter Buck band. Yeah. It can be the Filthy Friends, if Corin is, is there. It can be Alejandro Escovito, if he is there. And it's the same... Uh, you know the same stack of people. That's cool. So we played play together a lot. Yeah. And uh, you know Al's the one that always is going to want to take it to the next level, and so there can be some uh, guitar tossing and stuff going on. Yeah. Which is which is good. Yeah. You know, needs to be done. Yeah. You need to push that line as far as you can. Yeah. The guitar tech in you isn't cringing. You're you're just in the moment. You're happy. No, I get cringes as soon as the show is over, and I go, "Oh <laughs> no!" I said I wasn't going to do that anymore. <laughs> you're still the de facto guy to fix everything before the next show. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's usually, uh, you know, there's usually somebody on the uh, on on the tour that would be a guitar tech enough to handle normal people's problems of string breaking <laughs> and you know and that. But geez, like, yeah, I just I'm just just my my brain. Usually towards the end of the tour, things get a little bit more. Uh, you know, because you want to be able to take it to the next level for one, but then if you know there's only a couple more shows, like oh, I can take some chances if I have to <laughs> take, if I have to get the after the two more shows, then I can go home and I can take care of whatever needs to happen. But I remember the the Black Les Paul that I play in that band. I usually don't even realize this till it gets home. But the the Bigsby had it was like you know three eighths of an inch. That it had moved this way. Wow. <laughs> you know, there's just, it was being just ripped out of the back of the guitar. And I don't remember why. I don't sure. remember the point <laughs> where that happened, but you, know, you start playing, it's like, wow, this is being, it's not, it's not staying in tune the way it usually does. Cause the one that I have, you can pick it up by the Bigsby and swing it around and it will still stay in tune. It's like, just not doing that anymore. What's going on? You look at it, like the, all the four screws at the end of the just thing are stripped just, out, just ripped out. <laughs> okay, that might have something to do with it. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> or, or like just bring it back from the you know. Then it's like okay, fill them all in, redo this. Get I think I, I think I even went and got some new springs for it. Oh yeah, and the not just the Bigsby spring, but the spring that holds the bar onto the plate there's a spring in there too and it was shot so it was just really loose and so i bought a few different springs and figured out what how what to put in there to make that work a little bit better and then i think it's got a crack in the headstock too which is not keeping it from being played and i don't think it's going to go out of tune but it's you know something to definitely something to keep, keep an, an eye on, <laughs> and I think that did happen in Seattle at the Seattle show we did here. Right. I think it, uh, I think it got thrown on the stage and and stepped on. In in the heat of the moment, yeah, and it's like, uh, that, that's that's on that list of things that I said I wasn't going to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you've got me wanting to see one of these shows. So yeah, yeah. I, th I think the the Seattle Alejandro show was the best that band is yeah i think it was pretty much the so far so far the uh the peak of all right that band's prowess yeah and and scott is recovering from his stroke and doing fine yeah yeah he's 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 on the mend and uh out of the emergency situation and um you know last i'd seen he was playing guitar with one of those things on his finger, the little pulse monitor. Or oh, whatever, yeah, the oxygen thing. There, yeah. with, the, with a wire coming out of it. And he's trying to figure out how to play, play guitar without using, with the wire coming out of that finger. So, All right. you know, it's pretty hard to stop that guy. All right. He's not going to let a, a minor, uh, a minor major health problem get in his way. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Kurt. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. This was awesome. Oh, sure, sure. Have I, a good uh, have a good editing session. <laughs> oh, we we won't edit at all, but we will invite you back for the follow up. So <laughs> yeah, we can pick up in. We're picking up in 1983, yeah. where uh, <laughs> after the. Now, I don't remember that. That's a good question. Like all these things, make, I start thinking about all these gear, all this gear and stuff, and that Sound City head. Yeah. No, I need to go online and see if I can find a, a, a reasonable deal on six, six EL34s. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear this thing. Yeah, yeah, it might not, it might, <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, of course you, you guys know exactly the sound that you want is, you know, Michael Schenker or, yeah. or uh, you know, Eddie Van Halen or, or uh, you know, Johnny Ramone or something like that. And when we were when we were playing it to start with it it sounded exactly like that to me and then hearing the recording of it just shattered me but then listening to the recording 30 years later 35 years later you know it's like wow this sounds what you know people i, I think and, and i've been recording people's bands yeah 
and people bring their gear in and they play and they listen to it back. It's like, nah, it's not really what I was thinking. I really want, no, buddy, it sounds killer. I mean, I remember that moment when somebody telling me that, it's like, guitar sounds fantastic. Don't change a thing. You should be happy. It's like, nah. But, you know, how people are, they, they try to make something sound like the way they think it should sound. Sure. Rather than seeing what it sounds like with the least amount of diddling around. And, like, you know, a pedal like this has some controls on it, but just plug it into an amp. Don't even, just make sure the amp sounds fine. Just regular electric guitar. And then, you, like, whatever... Make some sound cool without too much fuss. Yeah. You know, without little tiny micro switches that can you tell, do they really make a difference? Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but without so much stuff that you get lost. Yeah. And people with a giant pedal board, that's great. There's great cool sounds that could come out of it, but what if something doesn't work? Yeah. You know, I remember going a friend's band was playing and pedal board didn't work and it was at the at the chop suey and it turned out one of the pedals i forget what was wrong with it and i was like oh, we can i you know probably can probably can help you with this i do have a little tiny toolbox we can go you know work on it took it apart and i forget what it was it was something that was not just a solder joint but something had come apart and I didn't have a soldering iron, but we figured it, figured out how to make it work at least for the show. Yeah. But I mean, you know, the guy had, you know, 10 pedals or 15, you know, two or three rows pedal board, Some great sounds. But how do you think of all that stuff when you're trying to play, when you're trying to play the songs, you know, it's just like insanity. But we're talking about Adrian Ballou, who's, you know, on another planet yeah. as far as being able to play insane guitar, sing the songs, and, you know, have more stuff to step on than anybody. And the last time I saw him, he has a computer over here with <laughs> who knows what all that does. It's like, how do you, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't do that. Got to keep it simple. 